and welcome to Tuesdays with the Pilgrim. Today we continue A Prophet in Babylon, Chapter 5, Part B. As you recall last week, Dr. Jordan and Reverend Gaunt were talking in the study, and we continue on now from that point. At that moment, Margaret entered the library. The conversation ceased, and both men rose. Gaunt's first impulse was to conceal the nature of the conversation from his wife. Then suddenly the recollection of his early morning reverie came back to him. He had blamed himself for shutting Margaret out of his life, and at the same time had yearned for her sympathy in the inner matters of his life. Here was a decisive test of whether she was indeed capable of that sympathy. His eye rested on her with more of that early tender passion of the devoutness that he had known for many years. She looked pale. Had she also had her painful dreams? And this was surely her question as much as his. He took his resolution instantly. Margaret, he said, Dr. Jordan was just discussing with me the events of yesterday. It seems the papers are full of reports about me. I'd like you to hear what he has to say. It concerns you, too, and we'll advise together. Margaret looked at him with a grateful smile and silently sat down at his side. Now, Dr. Jordan, you were saying... Jordan went over the ground again, taking care to explain with more than his accustomary suavity the points he wished to emphasize. He was secretly annoyed and embarrassed by the presence of Mrs. Gaunt, but he was too much an adroit man to betray the least discomfiture. And what do you advise? said Margaret. Well, it's a little difficult to say offhand, but it seems to me the wisest way would be to give out that you were suffering from a nervous breakdown, and to go away at once to Florida for a month. It's a mercy for us ministers that our people have very short memories. We suppose that they remember our sermons, and some of them like to pretend that they do. As a matter of fact, they forget them in a month. Go away, and you'll find it will all blow over. Take care that you don't give them any good supplies while you're away. That will increase their gratitude when you come back. They'll come back with flying colors, and very likely get a new start and do better than ever. There's nothing like a nervous breakdown to quicken people's loyalty. Gaunt could not forbear a burst of laughter, but even while he laughed, he was conscious of the deepening sense of annoyance and rising disgust. Jordan's remedy for his difficulties was really too colossally impudent in its complete disregard for the vital elements of the problem. And you really think I could do that, he said. Why not, said Jordan, with a grave smile. Let us look at the facts of the case. You've a little overstepped the mark of discretion. That's no great sin. We're all liable to do it. No one will think the worst of you for it, unless you persist in it. As a matter of fact, you've got a splendid advertisement out of it. A month's judicious silence, and I repeat, you will come back to your pulpit with added popularity. Oh, if popularity were everything... If that was what I was playing for, I dare say you are right. But you forget that this is a question of truth and self-respect. I must go on in the course I have taken at all costs, or lose all right to my own respect and the respect of others. At all costs? That's a large order. I wonder whether you have really counted the costs. Here and there a man is born who can afford to talk in this way. He usually comes about once in a century. Even then he is commonly the child of a movement, not its creator. He happens to speak something that is in everybody's mind, and that is why he succeeds. He hits the psychologic moment, and that is all. Do you suppose yourself that kind of man? If you are not, the wisest thing you can do is to have the sense to come in out of the rain. I don't pretend to be any particular kind of man, Jordan. I'm just myself. I've done what I thought right, and as for counting the costs, I've never thought of them. No, I suppose not, and that's why I came to see you directly. I knew what had occurred. Now don't be angry. You know that I am your friend, and mean well by you. I've seen in my twenty years' experience a good half-dozen men as brilliant as you fizzle out, not through decay or power, but through indiscretion. Where are they now? Some of them are eating their hearts out with chagrin and miserable country churches from which they will never emerge. They've been relegated to obscurity and are glad to do a priest's poorest duty for a piece of bread. One of them is an ill-paid journalist. He thought the press would welcome him and he'd be an editor. 
He's a disappointed journalist doing hack work for a pittance, and he'll never be anything better. Another of them is actually a book hawker. I bought a trashy encyclopedia, which I didn't want from him the other day, just as an act of charity, and he once had a church as good as yours. The trouble with all these men was that they thought themselves bigger than they were. They imagined they could do as they wished, and they didn't understand their relation to their churches. Now the plain fact is no man can do as he likes in a church, however strong he is. If he can't carry his church with him in what he does, he has to go, and that's the brutal truth. The church is always stronger than the man, for the church knows perfectly well that it can get a hundred men to pick and choose from, and the man knows he can't get a church. You assume I'm at war with my church, interrupted Gaunt. That is not the case. My church has always given me the fullest liberty of speech, and I have no reason to suppose they wish to retrench that liberty. Fiddle-dee-dee, said Jordan. Really, Gaunt, you amaze me. Don't you know that this boasted liberty of speech means nothing more than liberty to say things to your people like you say? Begin to say the things they don't want you to say, and you'll soon discover how little your liberty is worth. And you amaze me, retorted Gaunt. I never heard from anyone so low an ideal of a church as yours. It may be low or high, that is a matter of opinion, but I know it's true. I could wish it otherwise, and if wishes were wings, pigs could fly. So being a moderately wise man, I don't spend my time in idle wishes. I take my facts, try to understand them, and act accordingly. If I have to drive a freight train over a bad road, I don't try to run it like a 20th century flyer. I know it can't be done. I economize my steam and do the best I can, and I am content to get through on scheduled time, though the speed be pretty poor. After all, it's better to get there than to bust up on the way through overzeal. Well, the church is a pretty heavy freight train, and you can supply the rest of the parable yourself. Keep to your schedule. You may be sure it's the best that can be done. I know your church better than you think. I knew it long before you came to it. You don't like Roberts, and you despise him for his business way of looking at things. Now, I know Roberts very well. In fact, he's an old friend of mine. He's really a very worthy man, a little pretentious, of course, as you know, and he really loves the church, and would toil day and night for its success, for it's the only bit of idealism in his narrow life. Why offend him? In your position, I should conciliate and use him, and it's the same with all your people. They are proud of their church, but if you antagonize them, they're only human, and they'll retaliate, and then you'll get at the true nature of your costs. You'll have to go, and you'll get a dreadful fall, and you'll find that the papers which hail you as a prophet today will forget your existence the moment you're a discarded minister. Now can't you see that it's better to get your freight train through on good time than to wreck it by attempting the impossible? Oh, I see that you're right from your point of view, Jordan, and I should be ungrateful if I didn't recognize that you really mean to help me. Only you see, our points of view are very different. Well, you'll come to mine in time, when you've thought about it enough, said Jordan cheerfully. The signals are against you. Don't outrun your signals. Take my advice. Go to Florida, and when the prodigal comes home, there will be the usual festivities. Gaunt, in spite of his resentment, felt it impossible to be angry with the man. He was so imperturbably amiable, so certain of his own wisdom, so sincerely friendly and well-meaning. He shook hands with him cordially, although he knew that a great gulf separated them. I shall leave Mrs. Gaunt as my ambassador, Jordan said as he left the room. Mrs. Gaunt is a practical woman. It's a lucky thing for you, poor babes of genius, that you have given to you by a merciful providence a wise woman to mother your ignorance. Gaunt accompanied him to the door. When he returned to the library, Margaret was still standing as he had left her. Her face was pale, her attitude pensive. Only in her eyes, which were unusually bright, as with a dew of tears, was there the indication of some hidden significant upheaval in her thought. Well, Margaret, what do you think of him? Didn't he make you think of Bunyan's Mr. Worldly Wise Man? No, she said slowly, not of Mr. Worldly Wise Man, but of someone much worse. Someone sleek, crafty, cruel, a huge purring cat with restless talons. 
And not that altogether, a creature consciousless, who didn't know it, a man reconciled to evil and little ways of believing them good and wise, a tempter of the soul with lips of honey. I shrank from him as he spoke. I hated to take his hand. I felt it had the power to drag me down. And when he left the room, I drew a long breath and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. For answer, Gaunt stooped and kissed her. A great wave of love and gratitude swept through his heart. In that moment he knew that his wife understood him, and that she had truly entered into his inner life again, and would never again stand outside his heart's door. Whatever happened to him now seemed but a light price to pay for this sweetness of restored confidence, this divine newfound happiness. And that's the end of chapter 5. We'll pick up next week with chapter 6, a discussion. Until then, take care, stay safe, and God bless.